I remember flying into Sydney. From way off in the distance, you could see that plume of pink smoke sailing off. Now, oh, you're getting, we're coming near home. You know, the person next to the plane would say, look, we're getting near home. Look at, you can see the, the, the pink smoke. On some days when the wind was northeast, that cabbage smell, it was from the coke ovens. And that smell would spread all over the town if the wind was in the right direction. The plant was always there. For someone like me who lived through that, who saw that the steel plant was there, I mean, it's just like unbelievable. It's like as if they removed uh, the Vatican from, from Rome. <laughs> Birds flock here now. Parents will push strollers along a leafy greenway. Soon, kids will play and kick soccer balls on green fields. When the government-funded cleanup project finishes, the former Sydney Steel site will be a placid refuge. But listen closely, for ghosts linger. time since we've gone through this gate, guys. Yeah, I walked through this my whole life. I used to wait here for my dad after work on my little yeah. bike. A lot of memories. A lot of yeah. memories. I was a kid on a bike selling Highlanders here for 10 cents on Wednesday, because Wednesday was payday, and it was a spot. <laughs> must be all, we got paid on Fridays when we were first here, and it was all in cash. Yeah. A lot of men from the pier went through here over the years. Some in the blast furnace, the open hurt, the small electric uh, furnace that was here, the, the scrap yard was here on the other side. Once, half of Canada's steel was forged where children will soon play. Once, the ground here shook as thousands of men trod towards the steel mills and the coke ovens. Once, on these vacant lands, the epic saga of Sydney's steel industry unfolded. It seems like ancient history now, except the memory of extraordinary men and events still echoes through these fields. And in these communities, a heart of steel still beats. I was very proud to be a steel worker. I enjoyed my job, and I was good at it. And I loved every minute of it. I loved every minute of it. When I got there, I did the job. Iron and steel are 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So the heat is constant. It's always there. And you don't get a nick or a scratch. It's usually your broken limb, and sometimes your life. My dad worked here for 43 years. My grandfather worked for 49 years. And I worked for upwards of 20 years, so. And you know that it's a hot and hard job, but you work hard. The old saying was, uh, no smoke, no bologna. My name is Irma Maxwell, and I was born and brought up at the pier. And I started at the coal covens around 43 all hot and the sulfur and oh my god. Uh, we had guys that could run the mill and it was just like tuning a fiddle. They were that good at their trade. I mean, they, they were phenomenal. The plant had an excellent reputation. The best rails in the world, by far. Photography was my hobby. I have a lot of photos, for instance, of people working. I had to have some, um, some action, but I like the action. I like the open hearth a lot. Yeah, if the plant, I, I, I would definitely like to see the plant in operation now. I went over there to work for the summer, and I liked it so much I never left. Steel and coal were king in Canada. 
and Cape Breton Island was the royal palace. Sydney's steel industry began as the single dream of a wealthy, charismatic Boston scalawag named Henry Melville Whitney. Henry Whitney, he, uh, he was from Boston. He was a strong businessman, oh yes, he was a very successful businessman down the state. He was also, like a lot of the people at that time, a, a speculator, uh, the idea of conglomerates. He owned a, a lot of uh, like railways, uh, tram lines, electric company. And of course, the way I think the Americans still do, most of their electricity is generated from coal. So there you go. The cheap fuel. And that's cheap energy, and that's what they, that was always the, the key thing here. Now, back in the 1890s, uh, there had been a lot of individual little coal mining companies, but they had conglomerated. They began producing a lot of coal, and a, more coal, and a surplus. He realized with that surplus that, that he might be able to set up a steel plant here. And like any good uh, uh, entrepreneur, he could sell not only to the city, but to the province, who were really looking for industry. I mean, there was a great thirst for industry uh, in Nova Scotia. <laughs> Isn't there always? He was given virtually carte blanche, whatever he wanted, for over 400 acres of land, 99-year lease, tax-free. Uh, well, the province got it down to 30 years, but please, no, 30 years. So consequently, he came to town, and he was welcomed as a hero. The big celebration and everything, and the uh, steel plant uh, began. Then Whitney got down to business, installing top-of-the-line equipment using the most modern European designs. When the first heat of steel was tapped from the open hearth on December 31st, 1901, Sydney possessed the most up-to-date steel plant in the world. The Sydney would have about 2,300 people, including the suburbs. <laughs> Very small, little colonial town. With the arrival of the steel plant, there was this need for, for, for labor. And the railway ended at Inverness, as it were, came up to Sydney, and so that's where the people landed, and they just began flooding into the town. The newcomers came at the perfect moment. By 1912, the Sydney plant made half of Canada's steel. Every day, ingots, blooms, billets, slabs, wire and nails poured out of the steelmaking center of Canada. Railroad rails became the plant's lifeblood. So consequently, the place began to boom. And most of the de rapid development took place near the steel plant. So consequently, we see Whitney Pier, where the pier was to ship out the, the steel and the coal coming in. Well, my father was from the pier, and, uh, and at the pier there was numerous ethnicities. At one time, there was probably 10 or 11 churches. You had a Russian Orthodox, a Yugoslavian church, a Polish church, a Ukrainian church, an African Orthodox church, an Italian church, a synagogue, two Protestant and a Catholic. And like a fellow says, it's hard to escape the Lord if you live in Whitney Pier. Probably right up to the 1950s, some departments were dominated by certain religions. Like the Open Hearth was known as the Vatican because most of their employees were Catholics and the Heavy Mills was known as the Masonic Lodge because most of their employees were Protestants. And Italians, Jews, Hungarians, Ukrainians, Blacks. Newfoundlanders. Newfoundlanders had always been a mainstay of the mines over in, in the Sydney mines. So Newfoundlanders began coming in. And everyone got along. There was none of this racism or you're this and you're that. Everybody was equal. We had a United Nation long before it was ever taught of being. Experienced African-American steelworkers from Alabama came to work the Sydney blast furnace. So many newcomers flooded into Sydney that a housing shortage quickly developed. 
The steel plant built company homes for the workers close to the plant. A century later, the children and grandchildren of steel workers still live in some of these houses. So the laborers would be near the steel plant, and then like another ring of your onion going outward, uh, you get people who, who might have uh, more foreman's jobs, like around Ashby. And then further up from that, um, you get the, well, the wealthier people as far as they can get from the steel plant as possible. Mi'kmaq people have been around Sydney Harbor, who knows, thousands of years perhaps. Um, and the original settlement from my community, the community of Member 2, uh, was along King's Road, where the present-day Sydney Medical Arts Building, um, near, the, near the Comfort Inn, for instance, is on King's Road. And as people began to build more residences, begin more businesses, um, it began to push out uh, towards the area where Mi Member 2 was. Prime property, As a matter of fact, Moxham's Castle, the, where, the, uh, where the people that owned the steel plant or general managers lived all along there, uh, King's Road became King's, you know, road. There was a number of residents, unfortunately, uh, who felt very uncomfortable with the presence <clears throat> of a Mi'kmaq community uh, in that part of the area. Over a period of years, these petitions came and they went. Uh, the court ruled that the King's Road Reserve had to be relocated. And so the move began around 1926. It took about three or four years to dismantle the old reserve, but finally around 1929, the final family moved from King's Road to the existing, or the present day, member two. When war broke out, Sydney steel workers did their part to beat back the Kaiser. Overnight, it seemed, the plant was running at full capacity, producing shells for the war effort. New coke ovens were built to keep up with the demand. Before long, the steel mills of Sydney, nearby Sydney Mines and Trenton on the mainland, were turning out 40% of Canada's pig iron. When the guns grew quiet, a post-war economic slump settled over Canada. In Sydney, the hour of the wolf was at hand. After the war, it wasn't so good because by the time you get to 1919, 1920, there's this overexpansion. And then the market for steel eases and the steel plant really is, is um, in difficulty. And that's when we, we, we see Roy Wolven come into the scene, an American, um, I mean, say capitalist, uh, entrepreneur, speculator. He decided the best thing to do was not only bring, keep the steel and coal together, but bring in shipping and bring up as much industry as possible into this to form a conglomerate for efficiency. And that's with that idea, uh, the British Empire uh, Steel Corporation, or BESCO, was formed. And he is the chair or the president of BESCO. It was the biggest conglomerate in Canada at its time. So, he, <clears throat> but there were problems. The steel industry everywhere had overexpanded. Sydney was no different. Too many coke ovens, too many coal mines, too much overhead. And as a result of the shrinking industry, how was he going to do it? Well, it was going to, to have to be on the back of the workers. So consequently, wage cuts. And I mean wage cuts. I mean, they go down, you know, 50% wage cuts. And of course, this doesn't sit well. The steel workers and coal miners down their tools in a desperate fight for their rights as workers and human beings. The forces allied against them were too great. Provincial police rode down innocent people in the streets. Canadian soldiers, bayonets fixed to their rifles, marched on strikers. Besco cut off food, water, and power to the steel workers and coal miners and their families. When the steel workers and miners refused to quit, Besco's police attacked with nightsticks and bullets, leaving a father of nine dead from a gunshot wound through the heart. Besco quelled the strikes but they still couldn't run a profitable company. They couldn't make the money off the back of the worker. They couldn't keep it going, and BESCO collapsed. And it, it was gone by the end of the 1920s, and, um, and Roy Wolven with them. <laughs> he was a much hated figure in, in, uh, in, Can in Cape Breton history. The wolf, they called him. But steelworkers are resilient people. They pushed and they pressured. In 1937, the Nova Scotia government finally gave them the right to organize a union. 
Suddenly, the steelworkers' future burned brighter. The bombers begin the invasion blow. Great air fleets hitting German defenses. Smoke bombs are used for guidance as thousands of tons of high explosives rain down, smashing Nazi transport and fortifications in preparation for the second front landings. Watch, a road junction is hit. Down to the docks of southern British ports, the invasion troops go streaming. These are pictures of the historical record showing the embarkation of the striking force of American, British, and Canadians. World War II meant the steel plant was again running at capacity. Labor was at a premium. Young boys were hired to meet the demand. So too were some 700 women who used to be relegated to clerical duties, but now got their hands dirty operating cranes and doing other essential work. My name is Irma Maxwell, and I was born and brought up at the pier. Well, I went to work at the uh, coal ovens and worked on the batteries. They hired women there because uh, the men went to war, see, and they were short of men to work on the batteries. And I was making $20 a week and doing the man's job. We had to be strong. I, uh, well, you call it breaking doors <laughs> on the battery. Yeah, because that's where they made the coke. And on top of the battery, they had these big round holes. And this cart used to come and drop all this fine stuff. It, they call it breeze. And it'd go in the ovens. All hot and the sulfur and oh my God. It was rough to work there with the, the heat and the sulfur. So you had to be strong. <laughs> it wasn't easy. You tell Irma for me that I ran the coke plant and I know what she went through on top of the battery. She deserves more than a medal. I want to tell you, she is one courageous young lady and I was 17 at the time, born and brought up at the pier. There was every nationality there, and everybody got along. And that's the way it was. It was beautiful at the pier. Say, so now if I'm black and you were white or whatever, and uh, something happened to you, I would go and help you. I'm proud to say I'm a pier girl. <laughs> you know, we knew every sights and sound. We knew the engines. We knew the locomotives. I wouldn't want to grow up anywhere else in the whole world but Whitney Pier. There was all kinds of ethnic diversity in the community, but you also had the best of foods. So you had Ukrainian culture with pierogies, and then you had Italians with cabbage rolls, and then you had uh, uh, chicken and rice with the West Indian. You had hot sauce. You had all of those different things or all the different origins. You had the Scottish people, the Newfoundland people with the fish cakes and beans and uh, those sorts of things, and 64 stores that were in Whitney Pier, and the culture. We were self-sufficient. You didn't have to leave Whitney Pier. It was all there for you. We all worked together, but then, and then we all how we played together. You know, there was a hockey league, there was a bowling league. In 1930s, a bowling alley opened in Sydney. And steelworkers embraced it. They all became bowlers, they just loved it. You see pictures of it back in the 30s, and they'd have a white shirt and tie on to go bowling. It was almost like a formal occasion. And that one alley that opened eventually led to six alleys being opened in the city. Today, there's none, there's no more steelworkers, there's no more bowling, I guess. But we all bowled. And every spring, the company put on a banquet at the Isle Royal Ballroom, and all the bowling leagues and teams gathered there for a nice meal and presentations and entertainment. 